Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, coming here and giving me a chance to speak to you. Uh, the topic of my talk is opportunity. And I was asked to talk about opportunities for young people in Pakistan. And uh, I said that I'm going to give a talk on opportunity, but it will be a slightly different talk. My talk, uh, the topic of my talk today is the one person society. The one person society, because in Pakistan, we only provide opportunities to the top one percent of the people, not to the rest of the population. So if you belong to the privileged one percent people, then you will have a lot of opportunities. But if you don't belong to the privileged one percent people, then sorry, opportunities are not for you. The apt name for Pakistan really should not be the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, but it should be called the one percent Republic of Pakistan. Because opportunities in Pakistan are only for the 1% people. Now, let's do a mental exercise and think about buying a farm. Suppose we buy a farm with a horse stable, and it has about 100 horses in the stable. And when you buy the farm, you ask the manager, what do you do? And the manager says that every year we send one horse uh, to a local race, a very competitive race. And, and so you ask, how does the horse do? And he says, every year our horse comes near the bottom. And he said, which horse do you send? He says, you know, we have a horse. We used to have a horse named Baba. And we used to send the same horse every year. And every year he would come about last or second last. And then once Baba died, we started sending his son inside a horse, child, uh, Humayun. And Humayun then goes for the last five, six years. And he also comes last or second last. And so you ask him that why don't we just actually have every horse in the stable race, see which is the fastest horse and we'll send that. He said, no, that's not how we do it. We just send Mayu every year. So this is Pakistan. We don't give opportunities to all 100% Pakistani kids to find out who's the smartest kid in Pakistan and then give them opportunities. We just give opportunities to the same people every year, every year, every year. And so we've limited our pool of talent to the 1%. So the 99% talent you ignore completely and then you look for talent from the 1%. So obviously then you don't get the 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 talent that other countries get who have you know who open the field to 100 percent people now the entire world is actually dominated by elites in every society this happens pakistani society is not unique in the sense that we have elite privilege we but we are a more elitist society than most but every society some more some less have elites who have you know control of the society who capture a lot of benefits of the society and and and, and who take advantage of their positions. Even in the U.S., for instance, now it is said and it is, you know, uh, people talk about the fact that billionaires in America pay a lesser percentage of in their incomes as tax than millionaires do, for instance. Uh, so even the very elitist billionaires uh, take advantage even in America. But what happens in America and what's, what's interesting and nice is that these elites keep changing. If you look at the rich people, 100 years ago, you had names like Ford and Rockefeller and DuPont. But if you look at rich people today, you have names like Elon Musk, who was an immigrant from South Africa, or Steve Jobs, who was also a son of an immigrant, or Bill Gates, or, or, or Mark Zuckerberg, who were not rich or, or from a very privileged families. They were not from underprivileged families, but who were not super rich like the Rockefellers. But if you look at the rich people in Pakistan today, the Habibs, the Dawoods, the um, the Saigals, the, you know, the Manchas, they're very rich today. The Tabas, they're very rich today. But they were rich 50 years ago also. There are some exceptions, of course. But those are exceptions that prove the rule. In Pakistan, there is hardly any upward mobility. Look at any field. Look at politics. My own leader, Mia Nawaz Sharif, I mean, he's very successful in politics, but comes from a seriously privileged, rich background. Look at Bhutto's, come from a rich, privileged background. Look at Bran Khan, comes from a superstar cricketer, comes from a very rich, privileged background. All other politicians you can name. Everyone comes from a rich background. One exception was Altaf Hussain. Other than that, you can't think of a politician who's not from the very rich, very privileged background. Think of uh, generals. Our generals are, you know, how very few, one or two generals you can name whose fathers were not also high officials of military and who come from humble backgrounds. Otherwise, uh, general sons become generals. Doctors' sons and daughters sometimes become doctors. Businessmen's, you know, children become businessmen. And so, this society is not so dynamic and because it doesn't have upward mobility. If you look at American politicians, look at Reagan. His father was a shoe salesman. 
Bill Clinton's father was an alcoholic. Jerry Ford's father was like Jerry Ford was an adopted president, adopted child. Very humble background, but not in our country. Not in our country. Nobody, you, you don't see a, a son of a Mali or a driver or a Bawarchi or a cook doing well in Pakistan. It doesn't happen. And so we limit our society's leaders, the better top scientists, top professors, top uh, doctors to the very, very few. And how do you, how does this, our, our elite sustain this? How does, how do we sustain this keeping the, the masses down, the colonial the idea of, you know, keeping the masses down? How do we sustain this? Well, think about this, that the armed forces of Pakistan is basically represented by two districts in North Punjab. A couple of districts in Central Punjab dominate your higher echelons of your bureaucracy. They say now that in Sindh, the last 13, 14 years, the Sindh government has basically hired, I think, 95% of the people they hired only speaks in the language. And there are many other speakers who have been in Sindh. 30, 40% of the population are not hired. But every ethnic group in Pakistan has issues with each other. But, but, but the barrier in Pakistan is not Punjabi or Sindhi or Urdu or Pashtun or, or Baloch. The real barrier in Pakistan the linguistic barrier in Pakistan, what separates the elite from the masses is the English language, the language in which I have been asked to speak to you today. English language is the barrier in Pakistan. That is the barrier in Pakistan. So this is from one of my favorite poets, um, Anwar Masood Saab. So, uh, Anwar Masood Saab, this was his uh, kata. Uh, but, but the thing is that English is the cleaver in our society. It separates the masses uh, from the elites. And how is this sustained? How is this sustained for so many years? Well, it sustains because we have an absolutely horrible education system. Absolutely horrible education system. We have three streams. We have one stream which is mostly very, the, which is all public schools and very low price, low quality private schools in slum areas and stuff like that. And there the kids are trained or educated, but basically there's just baby set. You know, you, you go there, you spend five hours, you waste five hours, you come back home. And these kids are being trained to become poor members of society, lower middle class poor people in the society. Then you have... This, you know, nicer English medium schools, which are expensive fees and all that. And there the leaders are trained to become, you know, middle class managers, professionals and all that. And that's, you know, good. And there are some exceptions in this school that some people from this school system will go and make it to the very top. But they are sort of the middle class Pakistanis. And then there are only two schools. Two schools which provide the elite rulers in Pakistan. In all of Pakistan, 22 crore people or 20. 228 million people. There are two schools, ladies and gentlemen, two schools. HSN College, Lahore and Karachi Grammar School. HSN College, Karachi, Lahore provides you with half of your cabinet today. It provides you with your political elites. It provides you with your military elites. And Karachi Grammar School will provide you with 70% of rich people in Pakistan. 100% of rich people's children in Pakistan go to these schools. With the exception of maybe the Islamabad International School, Islamabad, the Karachi American School, the Lahore American School. There are some exceptions. But these are basically the two, three schools which are for the very elite, for the for the rulers, you know, like the Goras used to have this uh, in, in the colonial days. These are the very schools. And then you have these middle class schools, the good schools, but those children also have a ceiling. And then you have this huge system of, of government schools, uh, which is basically not training people. You have... Kids coming out of 10th grade who cannot write two sentences in English or two sentences in Urdu or two sentences in whatever language they are taught, Sindhi, for instance, who cannot find percentages, who cannot do long division. This is 10th grade kids. 80, 90 percent of kids cannot do this. You're not educating them. For the last, God knows, 50 years, 70 years, we've been having discussions about what language should we teach our kids in. Every Chinese scientist has learned science in Chinese. Every Japanese scientist learns you know, science in Japanese. They all go on to win Nobel Prize. And in this elitist society, if a film actor actually 
speaks English really badly or speaks English in a funny accent, we may laugh about this. It's a weird society. And we sustain this privilege. And so we've not been able to decide whether to teach Saraiki kids in Saraiki or Urdu or Angrezi, English. We've not been able to decide whether to teach Sindhi kids in Sindhi or Urdu or English. And then we somehow we've decided that we're not really going to teach them science. We're not really going to teach them math. And then we used to be, and, and, and the 1% kids who go to America, who go to England, and, and 1%, I mean very generous, it's much less than 1%, who go to America, who go to England, who come back to Pakistan, and all the nice positions, the power positions are for them. And so you have really smart people, but they're working in Pakistan as carpenters. You have really smart people who are working in Pakistan as bus drivers or car drivers. These kids in America who come from such humble backgrounds, sons and daughters of bus drivers and sons and daughters of, you know, uh, cooks, they go on and become professors in American University. They go on and win Nobel Prizes. They go on and win field medals. And ours, you know, the smartest people, because they never had a shot. They never had a shot. So they, they are relegated to a life of drudgery. They are relegated to life of labor, unskilled labor. So this is a weird society in that sense, that it is absolutely a one-person opportunity society. I, since this was, talk, this was a talk on opportunities, I'm going to end this with a slightly positive note. And I'll tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, that in this globalized world, I'll give you the secret of success. Not my secret of success. My father was a very rich man. I'll be very honest with you. So, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, I could have been an idiot completely and perhaps I still am. Uh, but, but it, it, it sort of guaranteed that I will go to schools. And if I'm not really good, I will have private tutors. And, you know, if the private tutors are not good, I will have more private tutors. And by, by finally, I'll get, I'll be sent to some college in America. And then eventually, 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 I'll, you know, I'll get something and then I'll come and I'll have a, business, you know, maybe with a thousand employees and I'll become, you know, the owner one for day one and the boss day two and I'll be fine. And, and, you know, that's the story of most of our elites. But for the rest of the world, what is the secret to success? Well, as Nadim Laksa will tell you, as most economists will tell you, we talk about necessary and sufficient conditions. For some theorem to be correct or for something to be correct, we talk about necessary conditions and sufficient conditions. What is a necessary condition for success? It is still education. Education is the necessary condition for success. You could be really, really smart, but if you're not educated, you know, and if you're a carpenter, you'll just become a Roman carpenter. So I tell you that the only necessary condition for success in Pakistan, anywhere else in the world, is education. Now I'll tell you what is a sufficient condition for success, and that's important because that's sufficient, right? And the sufficient condition for success, ladies and gentlemen, is also education. Including in Pakistan, where you have no opportunities otherwise if you're not from the privileged class. Well, most of you, all of you are, are probably from English-speaking privileged classes. But, and why am I saying that education is a sufficient condition, not just necessary condition? Because in you may not become, you know, the manshas of this world and, and, and the habibs and the dawuds, the tabas of this world. You may not get to the very top at the, of the political ladder. You may not become the top of the, you know, Fauji ladder or the Malvi ladder or whatever ladder that you choose, you, you, you know, your, your profession is. But if you educate yourself and you're seriously well educated, you will get ahead and you will get ahead quite a bit. And that is the issue in Pakistan that this serious education we don't impart on our children. So if you need to be educated, you have to do it on your own. Perhaps in America, people used to take advantage of public libraries. If you read biographies of Nobel laureates, you know, they will tell you how much time they've spent in their local libraries, read every book and everything. In Pakistan, there's internet and all that, and you can do this. But the only stair of success that I know of, including in Pakistan, is education. So that's the one thing. But if this country ever is to become rich, if this country is ever to become even middle class, we need to be able to educate our children. And we are failing, failing 99% of our kids. Thank you.